Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. According to my clock, it's just past 11.30 a.m. So we'll begin the showcase as more of our guests and colleagues are joining us online. Can everybody hear me okay? Give me a thumbs up. Yes, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I'd like to let everyone know that we are recording the showcase today and we do intend to share the link with you all and our other stakeholders as soon as it's available on the Geoscience Australia YouTube channel. So please keep an eye out for that. Um, welcome to our guests from across Australia and around the globe. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and the waters that we meet across today. We acknowledge the elders past, present and future and respectfully appreciate that the lands and waters of Australia have always been and remain the custodial lands and waters of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It is upon their ancestral lands that Geoscience Australia is located. As we share our own knowledge, learning and research practices within Geoscience Australia, may we also pay respect to the knowledge and the traditions of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. My name is Alicia. I'll be your moderator for today's showcase. For those of you who joined us at our previous showcase, it's wonderful to have you here with us again today. For those of you joining us for the first time, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first Digital Earth Australia Showcase of 2021. And it's a special one. It has been timed following World Wetlands Day, which is celebrated internationally each year on the 2nd of February. And this year, it marked the 50th 50th anniversary of the signing of the Convention on Wetlands of International Importance in 1971, otherwise known as the Ramsar Convention. So happy belated World Wetlands Day to you all. First, some housekeeping. Because we have a lot of people joining us online, we will be muting everyone, so um, as to not interrupt our presenters. And I ask you to please ensure that your microphone remains muted during the, dur during the showcase. Um, however, we do really want this to be a chance for everyone to engage and ask questions. So following each of the presentations, we will be taking questions via the chat window only. In case you don't know how to access the chat at the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see an icon that looks like a speech bubble. Click on that to open up the chat and you can type your questions in there during the presentations. Um, please remember that that means your questions and your comments are visible to everyone here today. Before I introduce our first speaker, I wanted to draw your attention to my background image. Um, this stunning image was provided by one of our speakers today, Dr. Kathy Isles, and this remote wilderness supports endangered marine turtles, as well as providing important feeding grounds for dugongs and migratory birds. Um, Australia was the first country to ratify the Ramsar Convention by listing the world's first Ramsar site, this gorgeous site, the Coburg Peninsula in the Northern Territory in 1974. So this is a very special site, I thank Kathy for providing me with this beautiful image to share with you all. So let's begin. We've got four speakers with us today um, for what's going to be a really inspiring look at how earth observation science and some incredible collaborations are helping to manage and protect our precious wetlands. Um, our first speaker is our very own Bex Dunn, um, Earth Observation Scientist with the Digital Earth Australia program here at Geoscience Australia. And Bex is going to share with us all the development of wetlands information tools using satellite data. And then she will also introduce our next speaker. So Bex, take it away. Hello, good morning. Um, yep, uh, please let me know if you can't hear me. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming along today. Um, it's nice to be able to do this virtually and uh, communicate to so many people at the same time. So uh, I'm going to give you a very brief um, overview of what uh, Earth observation satellite data is able to really provide us with um, when it comes to wetlands. Many of you will potentially be used to seeing wetlands up close and personal uh, when you get quite wet in this kind of a, a context, whether it's on holiday or for some of your work. Unfortunately, as Earth observation scientists, uh, our view tends to be from slightly further away. So <laughs> if we're very lucky, it looks like this. And a slightly more realistic impression of that is uh, from our 705 kilometer orbit, maybe more like this even. So. Um, you can really use <laughs> up close and personal view to get a, a really good idea of what's going on with wet, wetland at any point in time. 
but with our Landsat, our access to um, United States Geological Survey and NASA data, not quite so close of you, very blurry, very far away, but you do get a bit of a broader view. So this is where I'm going with this. Uh, summarizing what a satellite can see in space and time. And I'll talk about how we're gonna get there. So zooming back in from a satellite perspective, you can combine satellite observations to produce images that look at the entire continent of Australia, which is a pretty big place and using satellite data that can really help us to fill in between actually taking surveys on the ground. So if we have a bit of a look at, for instance, this area, which is Lake Mournpool in the Hadda Lakes complex, satellites, unlike people, don't really have eyes, we have cameras, which is awesome. And with a camera, you can combine satellite data in really interesting ways. So we can usually see kind of three combinations of, of colors as humans. We, we have sort of red, green, blue um, rods and cone cells. Satellites pretty lucky, you can set them up to see slightly further around the spectrum than humans can. Um, so if we wanna build a tool say to look at how our wetlands are changing in terms of both vegetation and hydrology um, across 30 years of Landsat data, which is really where we're going here, we can combine the information provided by satellites in uh, different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum um, to do that. And so if we want to look at what a wetland's doing, maybe the first thing we'd think about or at least one of the things we think about would be what's happening to the water. So in order for us to uh, build a, an insight tool uh, to look at what the wetland's doing in time, we've grabbed this um, water detection algorithm, DEA water observations. And so that really highlights what the open water is doing. For example, this is a spatial representation um, and we can see this in space. So we can take snapshots of that and sort of stack it up and have a look at it in time to see how that hydrology is varying. On top of that, the next thing we might want to look at is what's going on around that water. So in order to do that, we've used the Tasselcat Wetness Index to identify areas of wetness around We've lost Bex, you're on mute, Bex. <laughs> Sorry, I was just uh, <laughs> muted by the host. <laughs> All right, so we've got water. We've got wetness. Now we might want to look at what the vegetation's doing. So in order to look at the vegetation, we use the Joint Remote Sensing Research Program fractional cover of vegetation algorithm. And what that does is it provides some information about what vegetation might be doing inside one of those pixelated pixels that Landsat can see. So roughly 30 meters, it'll split it out into fractions of photosynthetic or green vegetation, uh, non-photosynthetic or, or dry vegetation, and also into bare soil, which given the limitations of our eyeballs, just for the purposes of this demonstration, we've got it set up as green, orange, and pink. <laughs> but um, this is kind of a, a bit of a spatial representation, but if we stack them all together, you can look at this graph through time. On this graph, open water is represented as uh, the dark blue shade in the bottom of the graph. Um, the wet areas are a cyan shade stacked on top of the dark blue from the second color up. Uh, the green vegetation from the algorithm is uh, on top of that with the dry veg and the bare soil on top of that as well. So if you wanted to have a look at the, the Hadda Lakes through time, you could see the Millennium Drought, for instance, um, which provides you with a useful way of getting some insight on what might be happening between when you were able to make field observations 
and perhaps further check out what's happening with that wetland if it wasn't doing what you expected it to do as a wetland manager or uh, somebody using this kind of data. So yeah, the real value in this um, lies in that sort of at a glance, hey, you know, uh, in 1996, for instance, there was a lot of water there. Uh, in 2004, the wetland might have been a fair bit drier and you could either go and check on behaviour and look at things like um, uh, whether rehabilitation programs were working as well. So that's um, essentially the, the kind of wetlands tools that we've been building, trying to summarise satellite data into something that um, people will find useful. And just as a sort of a fun demonstration of other ways in which you can do this, I will attempt to play a video. Um, and I might just make sure that I can share the sound here too. Um, and this is what happens is if instead of turning this graph into a visual representation, we turn it into a sonic representation. So this is some work of my colleagues uh, in terms of communicating things in a slightly different fashion. So that's pretty much me. Um, I think we might be, oh yes, I'd like to introduce our next speaker as well. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Fernanda Adame. Uh, she's a wetland ecologist with the uh, Griffith um, Institute. And sorry, <laughs> Griffith University and the Australian Research Institute. So um, Fern is one of our uh, amazing collaborators um, who is doing a lot of work in this space. So I will hand over to Fern. Um, <clears throat> thank you very, um, very much, Bex. And it's really, um, amazing this tool that um, the Digital Earth Australia has developed and I want to talk a little bit more about it how we've been like very fine things in the field and how can um, this information be useful for the improved manage of wetlands around Australia so um, I okay so I'll start a little bit talking about how we're trying to do this in the field and how can, how, I want to talk about two examples of the usefulness of this tool. Uh, next, please. So the field verification. So, you know, as Bex was telling us, this is how you can see images from space and you can get a lot of information, but this is how I see the wetlands from the land. Um, very up close, you know, I get to feel the, wet mud and the mosquito bites in my skin. Um, but I also get to get this, a lot of information about how the wetlands look. And um, we've been going to different wetlands around Northern Territory, Queensland and New South Wales when there are interesting images. And what we've been doing is using drones to get some more information up close. But also these drone images, as I've told you before, they're being very useful to engage with different um, landholders, farmers, traditional owners and managers and finding ways um, to use this tool for improving management and conservation. Uh, so what we've been using is this um, commercial drone, it's a DJI Phantom and an app that's called Drone Deploy that being really great, uh, really easy to use to make uh, maps of drones, uh, maps, or maps, of, maps of different wetlands. Next. I uh, think, well, oh, okay. So this is, um, I'm gonna talk about the engagement with the traditional owners. So this is the first example. 
And this is um, one work that we've been doing with uh, the traditional owners on Mijeriba Mulgumping Elders in Council, which is what we know as Stradbrook Island in Southeast Queensland. Um, so when we approached them, they told us that they were concerned about uh, the water extraction that's taking place in the island. So this is an island that has very clean water um, because it's all filtered through the sand. And the council has been extracted water from the island for many years now. And what they've, uh, the traditional owners are concerned because they notice that this lake, which is called Brown Lake, it's being decreasing with time. So that's what they told us. And interesting enough, when we ran the tool, this is exactly the pattern that we see. We see that from 19, I think it's 1998 to you know, now, we see a decreasing trend in that dark blue color, which is the open water area. So that corroborates their impression. So they were very interested in having this information for them. Uh, next. The other um, uh, thing that they were uh, concerned about is seawater intrusion into the island. And what um, we can see here from that drone image to the right is there is a road there. And um, you can see the north of the wetland has been, it's a lot wetter than the southern portion of the wetland. Um, and you can see from that, uh, from the wetland tool info that in 1995, that's exactly when that road was constructed. And you can actually almost pinpoint the month. It's about like February of, so it's really amazing that we can see specifically that impact on that wetland, which caused of the open, the northern part of the wetland to become impounded. And that's where we see that bigger spike in open water. Then uh, similar to the images that Bex was showing us, you see the, uh, the millennial drought starting from 2000. 2010, then we have those wet years in Southeast Queensland, but now it's kind of looks like a trend that again, that wetland is getting uh, wetter. And why that is, is important is because they are uh, concerned that there be, because of the extraction of that's happening on the island, the freshwater wets, the freshwater lakes might be going down, but the salt water should, could be coming into these wetlands and cause irreversible damage. So again, this is another example how this tool can provide really crucial information that we could use to set up caps of how much wetland can be extracted from this island. Next. Um, the second example that we, uh, we found was in Kakadu National Park. And we've been working there with the Vinich Mungui uh, clans and Parks Australia and we went to them and see the wetlands and they told us their main concern was infestation of, um, of weeds in, in their wetlands. And here we can see again on the right hand side, a very nice image of what looks like it's a water that's fully covered by this weed that's called Salvinia molesta. Uh, next. So far, what they've been doing to manage this weed is they have some like they remove it, but they also, um, like breed these weevils uh, that apparently are very good at eating that um, salvinia and they just release them. It's like a biological control so you can consume the salvinia. So again, we run that um, tool, the wetland tool for them. And you can see down, this is um, a time series from For My Hole, which is the site they're concerned about. And we can see how it has like natural variations. But what is interesting again, is like, if you look at 2016, you can see that there's almost no water on that lake. And interestingly, that's when the lake had to be shut down because there was so much Salvinia that it was basically the whole lake was covered up, it just makes the whole lake anoxic and everything dies in it. And we can see it perfectly in this site. After that, they've been managing the wetland, trying to include the weevils, trying to remove it, the wet the uh, water hole is still closed, but this tool could be very useful for them to do the monitoring and see whether this weevil control is actually working and when can they open this. And we can also, because we have the long time series, which is also a very novel thing, we can start differentiating between what are the natural fluctuations of the lake compared to what are the management activities that we're doing. So it actually provides us with guidance, like where should we invest and how should we invest in controlling these weeds. Next, please. 
Um, and so all this engagement that we've done is kind of providing us with a lot of information of the wetlands and trying to see how can this tool be implemented, but we can actually improve it even more uh, by these drone images. And this is the collaboration that we're actually working with them. And what we see here is uh, a drone image of uh, a water hole in Kakadu National Park. And this is what we do with the image. We tell, um, we can't digitize the same maps, but identify not only the bare soil, the dry vegetation, the open water, which is what you can clearly show through the satellites as the text shows, showed us. But we can also look at different types of vegetation to identify like there's water lilies um, and this is grass and this is actually trees. So we can differentiate between not only vegetation and no vegetation, but whether they're macrophytes or whether they are um, just grass. And this is very important, for example, in cases like this, weeds that look, they might look like vegetation from above, but they might be just uh, map, mats of plants floating on top of water. Next. So the other thing that we've been doing with this uh, drone images is having some fun at the office because it turns out that you can have so much detail in these drone images that you can identify animals roaming around while you were on the field. For example, we can see um, up here um, that little dot, we can like zoom into it and find out that that was an emu walking in front of us while we were in Macquarie marshes or the one in the image uh, below, it's um, water buffalo swimming in the water hole. And I'm showing you this because the, um, you can actually see how with the drones, 15 minutes flying the drone on top of one of these wetlands, and we can get such a resolution that can, we can actually separate blades of grass. We can tell with very high precision whether that's a grass or that's a water lily or, you know, or, you know, or it's an emu. So, um, so they're they being very useful and compiled with all that information that just signs that we can actually create really great products. Next. So anyway, just this is this just to finalize, I just want to really acknowledge and thank everyone uh, that has been uh, helping us in the field and sharing their information, especially the traditional owners and uh, national parks and all the rangers and of course to Geoscience Australia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fern. Thank you, Bex. And um, welcome to the, the people who have joined us during the, the presentations uh, as they've been going along. Um, I can see some, some virtual applause happening on people's profiles. So thanks a lot for that. Um, so we have one question that's just come through for you, Fern, I think. Um, how do we store the drone data? Uh, the maps. So uh, the drone dip, like you can the drones have themselves a usb uh cards and the the app actually stores all the pictures within it so it's really easy to just run the app and the you get all like about i don't know maybe we get like five ten hectares of drones it gets like about you know 200 500 pictures that you store them separately it could be just in a usb and then you upload that to this app and the app will make the like just stitch everything together and make a whole map by so it be stored in online and you can also have a backup in you know a usb or like hard drive yeah it's not that big deal that's great thank you fern um we've got another question that's just come through if dea could do one more thing to make your job easier fern what would it be oh i don't know it's hard because they're just making it so easy for me already so no, not, nothing really. And another question, um, do you distinguish between fresh and salt water in the data visualization? No, we don't. Yeah, no, we don't. Like we, we get, uh, I can get an, well, of course, if I, you're in the field, you know, um, I guess the one way to find out is probably looking at the vegetation. So if you have like a mangrove tree, you're very certain that there's a little bit of salt there. And yeah, so I guess it will be, you could infer it, infer it, or if you're in the field, you can see it, but I guess, you know, not from space, I guess. 
Fantastic. And one more question. Does the drone data have any associated discovery metadata? And if yes, what schema do you use? Discover, uh, well, I, I'm not sure I understand that. What, what's discovery metadata? Bex, do you know? Uh, the short answer is no to that one. Um, though we'd definitely be interested in talking about metadata and storage of that kind of thing going forwards. And there's some nice comments in the chat too coming through um, for you as well, Fern. So keep an eye on those. Um, we might move on to our next presenter now. Please keep your questions coming through. And if we have some extra time at the end, then I'm very happy to, to backtrack and, and cover off a few more. Um, but if we could um, introduce our next speaker, which is Mike Ronan, Wetlands Manager, Environmental Policy and Planning with the Queensland Government Department of Environment and Science. So Mike is going to uh, use the beta version of Wetlands Maps to display how the DEA Wetlands Insight Tool for Queensland um, can provide wetlands managers and scientists with important insights and information. So Mike, if you would like to share your screen. Will do, yep. Great. Everybody can see that? We can, Mike, thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, everybody. It's a great opportunity to present here on uh, the tremendous collaboration we've been having with Geosciences Australia. Um, just want to, I suppose, um, let people know about where kind of our wetland inventory is in Queensland. We have quite a comprehensive inventory of wetlands where they are, and uh, we have various different data sets that actually uh, display where they are. But it's a never ending kind of a situation where you have to keep adding to that information. So this here is our online map server, uh, Wetland Maps. And this is where we serve up uh, the information on our wetlands in Queensland. So moving to the next, uh, so just to give you a rundown on the context within which we work with the uh, Insight tool. This is the wetland mapping for the state. This is around uh, Fraser Island, Gary. And uh, if you click on any polygons here, Lacustrine and Palestrine wetlands, we link off to things like conceptual models uh, that allow us to be able to really kind of uh, get into what kind of wetlands they are. So that's the basic wetlands mapping and we have it in lines, points and polygons. And we value added, I suppose, another layer, which is groundwater dependent ecosystems. So what's the groundwater dependency of those systems? So you can get into the same polygons again and pick up things like rule sets on, um, on groundwater dependency and also some of the uh, conceptual models that actually go with the groundwater dependent ecosystems. So that's the uh, two things. So you've got the basic wetlands mapping, you've got the groundwater dependency. Uh, we then, I suppose, got, went into the whole issue of intertidal and subtidal mapping a very complex area to try and establish uh, inventory data for. And again, if we click on any of the polygons here, you link off to heaps of information on how those systems actually work. And uh, last but not at all least, in terms of our existing information, is our aquatic conservation assessments, because no sooner have you got information on how wetlands, uh, where wetlands are and the kind of groundwater dependency and people want to know how important they are. So using exactly the same polygons, the aquatic conservation goes through and scores based on inventory data of species and um, the um, rarity and so on of the wetlands, how important those wetlands are. So we already have a very significant amount of information on wetlands. But I suppose one of the things, one of the key management aspects that we, we need to manage wetlands is some kind of an indication of their hydrological regime. 
And um, we had um, seen a, a presentation by Geosciences Australia, Leo and Bex, and um, basically we'd, we, we kind of thought, it, would it be possible to actually link the um, water observation from space and the wetland insight tool directly to the polygons within Queensland because the decision makers use this mapping every day of the week. And so uh, through a very effective collaboration, we've been able to link every polygon and there are hundreds of thousands of these to the wetland insight tool. And now when we click on our wetlands, um which i hope will work yeah here we go uh, we have this displayed a wetland hydrological dynamics so you're looking at all that other information that we have on wetlands and then we can also get the um the hydrological regime the gaps here is a qa process we've put in to ensure that uh, we don't land up with um, information from where the, the satellite is is not giving us an accurate enough, uh, I suppose, um, feedback. So, uh, but it's very, very comprehensive. So this is a perched lake on Gary, Fraser Island. And this is an indication here of uh, a wetland over a palestrine wetland, which has a very, very different characteristic. And something that would be very topical for people is the recent fires that we had on Gary. Uh, and you can see those brown uh, indications there. They, they, they indicate where there are fires and um, in the past. And you can actually see the hydrological regime of the wetlands change quite a bit once the fires go through. So that's uh, offering us some very valuable um, management information even now and uh, we haven't had the tool that that long. This is um, is Stradbrook Island or Manjeriba uh, that um, that um, Fern was already speaking about. This is a, the perched lake that Fern showed you, which is uh, bear with me. There we go. So that's Brown Lake, and you can see there seems to be a trend there of the water, um, I suppose, not being as uh, as high as it was in the past. But in, if you go down to this window lake, which is an actual window into the water table, you can see that uh, this uh, lake, Blue Lake, seems to have a consistency in terms of the water signature uh, in the past. The other thing that's very interesting on Minjeriba is this lake down here. This lake had its aquitard, which is the, uh, the actual uh, thing that keeps the wetland in place, um, punctured. And you can see exactly when it happened. It happened in 2000, uh, did at the end of 2000. And that wetland now is a very, very different characteristics than it had previously. So very, very useful information and corresponding very closely with what we're uh, seeing in the state. But this is all um, sand islands. How does it operate in some other areas of the state? And as um, has been pointed out before, something like um, these... I'm in a Zoom um, meeting. I'm just trying to work out how to mute that. <laughs> Uh, if if uh, you've got a, a um, something like a dam going in, this is Warlong Dam. You can see exactly when it was built, um, and uh, that goes for virtually all the dams in the state. So we're we're very easily able to tell uh, when dams were were actually built. So uh, very very effective for uh, for looking at dams. As uh, Bex indicated as well, if we go out uh, out west, and uh, this is Lake Carowinia. This is out in the uh, Paru catchment, very, very dry part of the state. Um, and uh, we can see a very, very um, clear, I suppose, droughts uh, in the past. So uh, of the two lakes here, uh, Lake uh, Waiara, which is this one here, is um, a, um, a saline lake and it's internally fed 
and that's what the signature is there. So there was quite a bit of question before this, and it was uh, about exactly how often the lake was wet. And you can very clearly see the drought uh, periods where it completely dried up between 2005, 2007, 2015, 2016, and then between 17 and 2020. So no question whatsoever anymore about exactly how, how wet it was. If you then look at uh, Lake Namulla, which is a freshwater lake and gets feed in from the Paru River, you can see that while the two of them are right beside each other and you can still see the signature of the droughts, because this catchment, this lake gets water from areas to the north all the way up through the, the, the river and it flow overflows into this, its signature is completely different. So uh, we're getting, as I say, very, very useful insights there. If we do now move up to the Gulf, and um, this area gets the monsoonal trough coming through. And again, looking at the signature here, it's just completely different. Uh, but it also uh, differs between different wetland types. So this one here on the floodplain, you can see every year, uh, virtually without fail, you've got open water and then it dries right down and comes back up again. Uh, but if you actually look at uh, a lay, uh, another system just very, very close to it, this one is a different system. And yet, you know, we could potentially call them all the same because they just look like similar types of polygons. But its hydrological regime is completely different. It dries right down and never has open water in it. Um, just moving along to another um, area. Uh, this is in the Burdekin catchment, and there's a very large dam at the top of the Burdekin. And one of the features of the Burdekin, and it was built in, in uh, 1987, I think it was, um, is that the open water that used to exist in these lagoons no longer kind of happens. Uh, it's now overrun with weeds and got a huge weed signature. So the water hasn't run out. It's just changed to being a very weedy system. And then we had a huge uh, floods in that area in 2019, and it actually flushed the system out. So again, you can see that signature very clearly there. Just two more examples. So this is down in the, uh, and I'm just going anti-clockwise, uh, clockwise, sorry, around uh, Queensland. This is Rockhampton. Uh, and these are these some very, very interesting things that we just don't know what they actually mean at the moment. Uh, but if you, you look at some of these wetlands around Rockhampton, you can see that there seems to be a, a, a tendency of these wetlands to be getting wetter and having more open water and that goes for virtually all of them than what happened in the past. These are just these very tantalizing kind of signatures we're seeing and we don't really know what they mean uh, but uh, this tool is addictive and I would uh, advise anybody who's playing around on this, that uh, it just uh, don't start it first thing in the morning or you won't get anything else done for the rest of the day. And then the very last thing, this just came up last week. This is, uh, uh, we were asked to comment on a particular um, development and we were able to look around uh, the area and we can see where developments have gone in the, on in the past and have completely changed the hydrological um, so his profile of the wetlands in the surrounding area. So that's basically uh, what I just wanted to uh, kind of, I suppose, point out. Uh, it's a very, very valuable uh, system. We use it every day, and it's, as I say, it's only been uh, underway for a very short period of time, uh, but uh, very, very, um, very, very useful. That's it for me. So I just need to see how I can stop sharing. I think you have, Mike. Thank I you. I have. Yep. It's good. Yeah, thanks a lot. We've. Um, I'll keep. I'll just ask you to stay unmuted because we've got a lot of questions coming through. Yep. Um, so 
We'll start at the top. We'll see how many we can get through in, a, in five minutes or so. Um, one from Eamon. How is groundwater dependency inferred or verified? And what tools could you imagine to improve this? Well, that's a really uh, good question, Eamon. Uh, we have a process that we use called walking the landscape, which is how we uh, do our groundwater dependent ecosystem mapping in Queensland. It uses a whole lot of inputs, including satellite imagery, but it also includes local knowledge and groundwater bores and so on. And then we have accuracy levels that actually go with different levels of uh, what we you know, know for definite is groundwater dependent to ones that where we think it's groundwater dependent and we put those accuracy levels on the mapping. But satellite imagery is only one of the inputs to that. But we'll explore that a lot more in the future now that we have this tool. Thanks, Mike. We have another question here from Richard. Firstly, very impressive, Mike. I agree. Um, can one access or download the underlying data via the wetlands tool? Um, and is it accessed via the metadata tabs? The metadata tab uh, provides information on how the method was developed. At this point, you can't, you can actually download uh, the, yes, you can download it in CSV format. Uh, yes, absolutely you can. And it's already, people are already doing that. Yes, so definitely you can. Thank you. We have another one here. Would it be useful for management to be able to detect and characterize smaller wetlands that are currently not detected by WOVs? Yeah, the, uh, we, we have some very small wetlands and we've run them through, the, the tool has actually run through, uh, we've run them through with the tool down to I think about a half a hectare, a hectare, and um, it seems to still work quite well. But I think where we have to keep your eye on the ball is that as the technology moves on and potentially um, we might get finer scaled and Landsat in the future, uh, as I've kind of indicated with our inventory of wetlands, uh, this is a never ending uh, cycle and you can never take your foot off the pedal because there's always something that's going to come along in the future that's going to overtake what you thought was brilliant today. Very true. Um, one, we've got time for a couple more perhaps. Uh, can you briefly elaborate on your QA, QC methods to drop the satellite data? Well, the QA, QC, and one of the reasons why it's a beta version at the moment is uh, because we're, we're still testing it out. We have quite a bit of caveats in that on it, but we've, I suppose, in some way um, uh, depended on the uh, Geosciences Australia's QA processes and the um, scientific methods that they've had published in relation to the actual satellite or the wetland inside tool itself. There's a very comprehensive QA, QC process on the uh, underlying polygons associated with the wetland mapping, GDE mapping, and aquatic conservation assessments themselves. So they're updated every two to four years. And so there's quite a bit of QA associated with those but we do have to, as I say, it's out as a beta version at the moment because we still want to do more, I suppose, checking of, of how the linkage is between uh, the wetland mapping and the inside tool. But it seems to be holding up very well at the moment. Great, thank you, Mike. And we probably have time for just one more question. So um, one here, we've seen the percent area dominated by wetness. I wonder how the GA's open water boundary matches up with the Queensland wetland boundary. I'm curious if GA WAFs helps to identify wetland extent based on the hydrogeological expression. Uh, uh, that's actually a very interesting point and it's actually one of the reasons why this, um, this integration of the wetland insight tool with the wetland mapping is so important. Uh, it's difficult for satellite imagery to delineate an actual feature. Uh, but what we've been able to do here is the delineation happens through the wetland mapping process. And then we can characterize it with the information from the insight tool. And that's a very valid, and that was a very important question because, yeah, trying to actually delineate where something is 
uh, on the insight tool is much more difficult than trying to characterize something that you already have delineated, which is what we've done. Great, thank you, Mike. Yeah, there's some wonderful questions coming through. So I just uh, wanted to let people know that if we don't get to your question, we're going to pass them on to the speakers afterwards. So um, you, you will have an opportunity to get, to get a response. So keep them coming. Um, we might move on to our last speaker now. Um, I can see her sitting in Bex's seat. So um, welcome, Dr. Kathy Isles. Kathy's the Assistant Director, Wetland Section for the National Focal Point Ramsar with the Department of Agriculture, Water and the, and the Environment. And Kathy's going to talk to us about decision making in a vacuum and why Australia needs better wetland information. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, can everyone hear me? Thanks, Alicia, for the introduction. And hello to everyone around Australia. Hopefully a few people in Western Australia got into work early to um, watch our presentation. Um, I'm not Bex Dunn, but I wish I was as bright as Bex Dunn. And, and we're really privileged to be able to be working with um, Leo and the Digital Earth team on this project. Next slide, thanks, Axel. I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri traditional owners of Canberra and pay respect to their elders past and present. I honour their deep cultural connection to country and particularly their finely grained knowledge about our wetlands and their continuing care. Okay, I'm going to take you on a bit of a speed date with wetlands today because I've only got 10 minutes. Um, so I've got to cover a lot of ground. So I'll talk very quickly, but hopefully you'll keep up with that. Um, Okay, so we're going to talk about why wetlands matter, of course, um, what Australia's committed to in this space, um, why we need wetland information for making, and what's the status of our wetland information, and what are the next steps. And in saying that, um, I want to let you know that the Minister made an announcement on World Wetlands Day, in case a few of you don't know, that we would commence the process of working towards a national wetland inventory. So it's pretty exciting, but very ambitious as well. Okay, next slide. Here's some headliners for you. Um, Australia's the driest inhabited continent of the world. And we don't have a handle on the extent of the very ecosystems that help us maintain water in the landscape. And these ecosystems are critical, not only to our survival, but that of all our biota. And the fast fact at the bottom is that we're one of the last developed countries in the world that um, doesn't have a comprehensive wetland inventory. So why is this so? I mean, wetlands are truly our unsung ecosystems. They're called conservation's poor cousins, but they're globally declining at three times the rate of our forests. And the Ramsar's Global Wetland Outlook in 2018 um, estimated there's 35% loss since 1970. Now, Jennifer Howard summarised it pretty well. Um, there was a press release on World Wetlands Day. They have suffered from being seen as sort of muddy, buggy areas. They've got an image problem. Um, that weren't valuable. And we're now finding through all the work on ecosystem accounts that they're actually probably one of the most productive ecosystems, the most valuable, so many benefits. So next slide, Axel. So let's look at some of these benefits. They really punch above their weight. Um, Bob Constanza, who's the sort of, you know, the man that's been around this ecosystem service space for a long time, has estimated that they account for about a quarter of our global Services, but only cover 1.1% of the biosphere. Now, wetlands touch every part of our life. They provide clean water. Um, they're known for their nutrient cycling um, capabilities, their fish nurseries, water bird habitat. And some of you might have seen that work that ANU released um, earlier in the month. They're amazing um, sort of mitigation tools saving us in the quantified in that study, 27 billion over the past five decades in storm damage. So that blue carbon storage is something that's emerging as a, you know, a really interesting space. Now it's also, think about recreation and amenity. Think about some of the coastal icons, Moreton Bay, Port Phillip Bay, Roebuck Bay, Kakadu in the North. Um, these are all wetlands and they're spaces that we know and love. But I think the most important thing is that they are the ultimate biodiversity hotspot. And um, they're complex places, but they play, you know, they play an immensely important landscape function. And they range across all climatic zones, from Blue Lake in Cozzi across to our coral reefs. Now, I've 
put a few charismatic species there to just show you the sort of incredible species richness and diversity. And we know they're critical breeding and nursery habitat for a range of species. They're extremely important for those amazing migratory birds that travel south every year. And this bottom one is perhaps the most critical. They provide that refuge here in arid regions. So yeah, what more can I say? Next slide, thanks. Okay, but despite these values, we continue to lose our wetlands. And one sort of obvious measure of loss is how many ecosystems we're listing as threatened. And almost a third on our list of ecological communities, threatened ecological communities are wetlands. Now we know from our protected area data that our river ecosystems are underrepresented in our protected area estate. And we also know that our wetlands are at the pointy end of climate change. Think about the last two decades, marine heat waves that affected the north and the western coast, and think about the bushfires and the peatlands over the last couple of years. So, you know, it's an important space. Next slide, thanks. So what, what have we committed in Australia to do about wetlands? So as some Alicia pointed out, we were actually the first country to ratify the convention and listed the first wetland site, so in 1974. And we've committed to protect listed wetlands and we've got 66 of those, although that hasn't changed much in the last 20 years, the numbers. But we've also committed to actually look after all wetlands. And the Ramsar Strategic Plan provides that framework for what we should be doing to protect those wetlands. And we've got this unmet target because we haven't got a national wetland inventory. Next slide. So what does that mean? It actually affects all of the things we do in the wetland space. We can't strategically protect wetlands um, to prevent their loss if we don't actually know the extent. That means we haven't actually got a representative Ramsar estate at the moment. We can't actually measure how effective our policies are. And most importantly, without that spatial data, we can't get a handle on the magnitude of some of the threats and pressures. And we all know about sort of the development that's going on in, in river valleys. We know about coastal development. We know about particularly annoying pest species. And I've already mentioned the climate change vulnerability aspect. Next slide. There's other goals that we're not meeting as well, which is the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We're meant to be protecting and restoring our water related ecosystems. At the moment, we can't even report against that indicator um, about wetland extent. And in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, there's going to be new uh, biodiversity targets under the Convention on Biological Diversity, and they likely will have a goal about increasing the area and integrity of natural ecosystems, and there'll be indicators around extent, and once again, we're unable to report on that. Next slide, please. Um, I've um, been around the space for a long time. I've worked sort of 35 years in all sorts of positions. Um, and I've actually been a decision maker on the ground where the lack of wetland information has been quite critical. I worked in the Territory in the 90s um, and in the area outside of Darwin that was being rapidly transformed for agriculture. We had to resort to very crude tools, which was basically get aerial photos and start drawing lines around them. And if, we could, and if the landholder was amenable, um, we'd actually get on ground and do it a site truthing using veg. So it was, a, it was a really crude method. And the other thing that was missing at the time, and, and that largely relates to data, is we weren't sure what to protect and why, because there was no policy around why these wetlands and watercourses were important. So everything became a site-by-site -site negotiation, and you can see where that leads to, lots of loss. And what we're finding through the ecosystem values work is that there's multiple whys for why we'd want to protect wetlands. And a couple of the projects that I've listed there is the work in the Northern Gulf around wetlands values for fisheries, for water birds, shorebirds, and for traditional owners. Um, we mentioned the ANU study earlier on for mitigation of coastal flooding. And of course, inland chain of ponds and those systems are so important for drought water storage. Next slide, please. Uh, so where are we up to with our you know, wetland information? Well, it's fragmented, that's pretty obvious. Now, the directory that was prepared 20 years ago for the 30th Ramsar anniversary, and I was around then and involved in that project, is very outdated and, and the data underlying it had problems at the time. Now, the only continental scale mapping of wetland extent is the national mangrove mapping that Digital Earth Australia has also been involved in. Um, some states have up-to-date wetland mapping and of course Mike's just shown you the amazing system that Queensland has and if you'd asked me 20 years ago who would be leading in that space I wouldn't have said Queensland. So that is pretty exciting and th for those that don't know 
Queensland are the custodians of 65% of Australia's biodiversity. So it's really heartening to see the work that's going on in that space. In terms of the other states and territories, some have spatial coverage for only a few regions. WA is working on its um, wetlands in the, uh, the southwest. And the MDB uh, wetlands are mapped, but there's no public interface in terms of people getting access to that data. Okay, so there's a big opportunity knocking here and you've seen already with the work that Fern and Mike um, showed and Bex, you know, where we're heading. The, these advances give us that thematic and geographic accuracy, revisiting capability, data consistency, and it's cost effective. And wetlands have to be looked at from both spatial and temporal elements. And these tools are helping us interpret these really complex ecosystems. The other beauty is that this 30 year data set is picking up warming and the impact of those extreme climate events. So what are the objectives for this national inventory? Obviously you've heard that there's big gaps in the national evidence base. So as a starter, we need to map wetland extent and change over time. In terms of ideally, we'd wanna look at condition and those sorts of things, but we'd, we just need to get the, the mapping done. Now, it needs to inform planning and decision making in the very broadest sense. It's beyond conservation planning. Um, Mike's work is very grounded in terms of when he does the mapping, they also do catchment stories to actually, you know, talk to the people living in the catchments about the resources in their region. So we're talking NRM decision making, um, local government, site managers on ground, as well as obviously our protected area managers. And the third thing that we've listed there is that, you know, we've got to get our reporting act together. It's embarrassing. Um, we also, there's reporting at national state level, state of environment and water and catchments, and obviously local governments and others do their own inventories. So how are we going to build this thing? It's got to be a cooperative exercise. Um, the states and territories are the custodians of, you know, most of that NRM related data. There's already been some work to talk about the scope and the priorities. We want to um, canvas all the range of potential applications and users. That's greatly grown since we did the directory. We now have 56 NRM regions, of course, that weren't around in 2001. We want to try and leverage on the investments that have already been made in spatial capability. So one option that we're talking with the geoscience team about is doing chunks of work where the spatial data is available. And then through NESP, and there's a bit of research elicitation going on this week, we want to start filling some knowledge gaps and ground truthing in those data for the region. And our preference is to focus on the regions where that are understudied, that are also facing development pressures, particularly in Northern Australia. And then we want to kind of piggyback. So if there's already um, portals and states, water resource and related portals in, in, in the states and territories, is there ways that we can build spatial capability into them? And then of course, in parliament at the moment, there's um, uh, legislation about public sector da data sharing. Um, so we'll need to align with all of that stuff. Okay, so this guy's got a little bit of a message for us. Um, and after 50 years of Ramsar, I think it's time we got our act together, he's saying, and you can't protect what you don't know. And that's, that's I suppose, the premise that we need to go forward. So thanks everyone for listening and, and thanks to our geoscience partners and to Mike and Fern um, for bringing um, all this exciting work um, that everyone around Australia is really excited to. Thanks, Kathy. Wonderful way to, to end. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. First one's from Catherine. Um, what's the timeline for the creation of the National Wetland Inventory? Oh, Leo thought 15, 18 months, but I had a bit of a giggle when he said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, how long's a piece of string? Um, we will spend this year scoping and trying to get some of that work happening where there is line data available. It's going to be a negotiation with the states and territories. They've all got very differing capacities in this space in terms of their what mapping's already available and also their GIS capability. And I think Mike, when answering one of the questions, says it's not just a matter of taking the data from Geoscience Australia. There needs to be some interpretation and building at the state level. So we'll obviously be looking at capacities there. Um, 
I don't want to get to another 20th anniversary. I mean, uh, you know, 70 years and, and we have still to be in this kind of parlous state. And I think there's going to be some opportunities with the NESP over the next five to six years. So we're looking at that sort of time frame, but there's no reason why we can't start working on those regions where that line data is available. And that's what we're going to be pushing. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Cathy. Um, we've got some more questions in there, but we might uh, we might have to hold them over to answer those in writing. Um, this has been a really engaging showcase, so uh, we will endeavour to do that as soon as possible. But we'll wrap up now because um, that actually concludes our Digital Earth Australia showcase, and we hope you all enjoyed it. We really would love for you to engage with us further. Um, if you have comments on the showcase, if you have any more questions or you just want to receive further information on any of the presentations that you've heard here today, please reach out to us using the details on your screen because like Mike said to me yesterday, um, you don't have to make a song and a dance about what you're doing. You can work collaboratively behind the scenes in relatively small numbers to, to drive real innovation and affect real change for the benefit of our environment and our future. And we've seen the results of that here today and it's only just beginning. Um, I can't tell you how wonderful it's been to be part of a showcase with such inspiring and passionate individuals. So to our presenters, I'd like to say thank you uh, for speaking with us all here today and sharing your passion, but also for doing what you do because our wetlands depend on it. To our audience, on behalf of Geoscience Australia, we thank you all for joining the Digital Earth Australia program here today. And we look forward to welcoming you to our next public showcase in a few months time. Thank you very much.